All right, let's start at the very beginning. Where did you grow up? I was born in Buffalo, New York. Um, I actually left there when I was 17 and have been moving steadily south thereafter <laughs> because if you know Buffalo, Buffalo is a little cold. It is. Yeah. Please tell us a bit about your family growing up. Um, I was uh, one of two children, and uh, I was the oldest son, and uh, German, and I recently found out Polish background, and uh, went to uh, grammar school, high school, and college in that particular area. Niagara University was, was the college, so uh, Buffalo had, a, had, a, had somewhat of an impact to me. I go back now, I can handle um, about 36 hours in Buffalo, <laughs> then it's time to say goodbye. Tell us a bit about your schooling in Buffalo. It was uh, it was typical uh, for for my family, typical Catholic upbringing. Um, I'm a, I call myself a cradle to grave Catholic, and uh, went to Catholic grammar school, Catholic high school, and Catholic university. Um, was also very active uh, in the church. I was uh, uh, a music liturgist and also a, a soloist from the age of eight in the Catholic Church, and I still do that today. You were in the seminary. Tell us about that. <clears throat> um, in in the old days, if you will, um, in the Catholic families, a lot of times they would designate a child of the families that was going to be committed to religious service. And I happened to be the lucky one that my grandparents and my parents thought I would be an ideal um, candidate for that. And so uh, right shortly after high school, I got sent off to a, a, an order called the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, which is in Upper State, New York, Newburgh, New York. And it's a contemplative order. So the contemplative orders are are pretty serious about what they do. And, you know, there's no talking. There's a lot of work. There's, you know, we learned how to use the, uh, the rope belt for other things. Oh. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I lasted about six months. Um, they had the um, wisdom to counsel me out. They thought I didn't have enough discipline to be a, a contemplative priest, but they thought I might make a good diocesan priest. So I got sent back to Buffalo, never did follow up any further than that. They, the six months was sufficient. Please elaborate a little bit about contemplative orders. What exactly does that mean? It means getting up at 4.30 in the morning, um, cold bowl of water to wash with. Um, uh, there was a definite pecking order within, within the seminary so that the novitiates, which is what we were, um, were very submissive to the, the priests that were, had been around a longer period of time. Uh, we did a lot of service, a lot of cleaning. There was gardening, and because we raised a lot of our own food at the uh, at the seminary, um, there was some opportunity to um, go out to the outside. And they usually sent that the novitiates on that, and we would teach uh, Catholic uh, catechism, as we called it, to um, outside the outside world, if you will. I happened to have gotten the um, all girls high school as my. Uh, my assignment and never could quite get it right. It was, uh, <laughs> I got in trouble all the time about sneaking hamburgers back that the girls would give me or candy bars and stuff. So obviously, I need a little work. <laughs> well, what does Catholicism mean to you? Well, it's a Christian. It's a Christ Christian tradition. Um, it is. It traces its roots back to Jesus Christ in the early church. You know. It, if, if you are biblically um, attached, uh, Peter, the very first pope, um, was uh, assigned as the rock upon which Christ said his church would be built. Um, it is one of the older Christian religions, but there, as we know, there have been many, many divisions and split-offs from that particular time. Um, the old Catholic church prior to Pope John the 23rd was very steeped in ritualism. It was Latin. You know, all, the, all the rites were done in Latin, so they didn't know what the fuck they were talking about. And the priest did all of his magic to back to the audience, so you never knew what was going on up front. And after John the 23rd changed it around a little bit, you know, now we're in English or your local languages, and the priest faces faces the uh, the audience or the congregation, if you will. So those changes were a little difficult for those of us of the old school to take. We were into the mysticism, we were into the the secretive um, and, and mystical, if you will. Um, 
elements of the Catholic Church. So it's kind of coming back that way. In fact, there's even rumors that the Mass is now going to go back to Latin. So that'll be that'll be interesting. What are your thoughts on that? I care not. I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> so are the changes to which you're referring uh, relations are they related to the Vatican II? The, the changes yes. that happened in the 60s? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So. That, that's caused quite a bit of schism in the church. There's still a very old element of the church that still practices some of old. But it's very difficult to find a mass in Latin or uh, you know, the, the old rite, as I call it. It's very difficult to find. We've, we've gone ecumenical. Well, what are your thoughts on women serving as priests? Amen. Should be. How about priests being able to marry? Absolutely. Don't tell me how to use my dick if you've never used yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, what opinions, thoughts do you have about the church's attitudes about gays and lesbians? That's one of the reasons that I'm having a difficult time even, even uh, resonating with Catholicism any longer. It's because they speak the words, but they don't walk the talk. And mo most organized religions is what I find that to be true anymore. That's sort of what's pushed me into a, a Buddhist tradition of spiritual practice because it's personal and it's practiced as an integral part of my life. It's not about what somebody else is telling me to do. And uh, many religions, regretfully, don't have an acceptance of God's creatures as, as, as I think God, or whatever power you call that higher power, means it to be. And, uh, so organized religion doesn't work for me very well any longer. It is really, really about a personal spiritual practice. What are some of the differences between Catholicism and Buddhism? Um, well, Catholicism tells you a lot of things that are not right, and Buddhism tells you that everything is right. Oh, wow. Even the stuff that we would categorize as wrong, because all of the all of the lessons that we have an opportunity to learn as as a practitioner of this journey in life, and if it, it's Buddhism that you choose to practice, indicates that without those lessons, no, no advancement in your spiritual and life practices would have that opportunity to exist. And so that stuff that we say is uncomfortable or it's bad is really not. It's part of what life is about. And so we, as as a Buddhist practitioner, is it's about acceptance and saying, I wonder what lesson I'm supposed to learn from that. <laughs> Hopefully I've learned it. Thank you, universe. I go on. <laughs> Please elaborate a bit on your spirituality. That, that seems to be a very solid core within it. It, it is. It, it's, been a, it's been a search um, for a lot of years, um, and I've, I've substituted lots of other things to, to avoid it. it, it um, but my question has always been about what is this short and brief experience that we have on this earth? How does it how does it impact why I'm here? What's my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? Um, and I have I don't have the answers. I haven't found the book yet that has all that stuff in it. But I think I've got a got a, a glimmer of right living has a, has a great opportunity to lead us there. And so that. Uh, the spiritualness, I've, I've, I've delved into the Jewish religion. Um, the mystical parts of a lot of um, practices have always attracted me. American Indian is very, very strong. I'm part, I'm part American Indian. So um, I think there are some roots there that that, uh, that resonate very strongly. And it's that, that mystical attraction, the understanding of the acceptance of, of, of a greater power that is on our side and not necessarily here to condemn us or to judge us, but simply to be at peace with us is, is the strength of, of my religious or my spiritual practice. Fascinating. Please tell us a bit about your time as an actor and singer in New York City. Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> well, um, as I said earlier, I. How I actually got into voice and vocal was, as a young person, I had a very serious stuttering problem. I was unable to put two or three words together without without that, that stuttering issue. And somebody recommended to my parents that voice lessons would be helpful. And so when I um, got engaged with a, with a vocal coach, um, they discovered that I actually have a gift of pipes that actually produce some sounds that are sometimes pleasing to the, to the human ear. And so from the age of about six, I was taking voice lessons and, and, and actually beginning to solo a lot of work. 
and um, did a lot of high school Broadway musicals, and you know, obviously the gay gene was in there, percolating away. So the Broadway stuff really called me. <laughs> and um, after after a period of time of, of experimenting in, in life forces, I, I uh, moved to New York City and thought I would try my my hand at um, entering and trying to be a Broadway star. Um, I did have a, a real tiny little bit of success. I was the understar understudy to uh, to the Judas character in the original Jesus Christ Superstar on Broadway. Uh, ben Vereen actually had the part. The motherfucker never missed a performance. <laughs> <laughs> I never got a chance to go on. Um, I off Broadway, mm -hmm. I, I played the role of El Gallo, um, the Spanish rapist. In, in that play, I played that off Broadway for about 11 months. But at that particular point in time, I was married. Um, I had a, a small child, a baby, and uh, it was very difficult to raise uh, a family on that limited income. So I really, my Broadway experience was a singing waiter at Mama Leone's. I got to do a lot of that work, and that's how I sort of supported myself. Tell us about your time in a motorcycle game. Oh. Well, that was before the Broadway thing. It was actually shortly after the seminary. As I said, I was coming back from the seminary, and um, I was really nervous about how my parents and my family was going to perceive my inability to um, meet their expectations of, of being the priest and future pope of the, of the Catholic Church, I think. And um, so I got off the train station in Buffalo, New York, and I had a pocket full of money. The money came from my, what my parents paid as what they call a stipend, which is what helps support you through your, through your seminary existence. And I had a pocket full of money and I was scared to go home, off the train, and right across the street was a brand new Harley Davidson shop. I thought, well, I'll stop in before I uh, go home. It'll help me you know, center myself, and it certainly did because that's when I bought my first piece of leather. That's when I walked, purchased my first motorcycle. And that's when I um, sort of left family a little while and went off to uh, to ride with a gang called the Outlaws. Now, if you're familiar with the Outlaws, they are sort of the East Coast Hell's Angels, if you will, though I've never found them to be of, of equal comparison. You know, yeah, they pissed on each other and we drank a lot and there was drugs and stuff like that. But um, I went to, uh, for a time, and lived up in a commune in, in, in uh, Portland, Maine, and uh, lived with the outlaws for a while and rode with them. Um, I learned a lot. I learned some, you know, I went to the seminary and learned a little bit about the rope stuff on the back, and I went to the <laughs> outlaws and learned a little bit more about pissing on people. <laughs> so my, it, uh, unbeknownst to me, my BDSM was beginning to, to get its groundings. Is that what drew you to King? Actually, I was not even drawn to kink when I first entered the leather. The leather is actually what brought me to this community. Um, you know, I, I, I've explained that I've been married. I've, I've got two kids. Um, and then sometime after that, I discovered, oh, dick, I like it. And, um, and became uh, what I call a gay man. I don't consider myself bisexual, even though I have a very strong lesbian tendency in me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> how, but, but, but anyway, it was the leather that always drew me in. So I, I had two very long-term relationships with men. Um, my first lover uh, contracted AIDS very early on in the AIDS crisis. Um, and died relatively quickly after he was diagnosed because there wasn't a lot of medicines at that time to uh, to take care of, uh, of the virus. And um, he did not like the leather, and so I put it away. And my second partner, I got involved with him very quickly after the first one died. Many times when we go through change, we jump into another situation that maybe isn't the healthiest one for us. And, and David, my, my second partner, um, already had AIDS, and so people thought I had lost my mind having gone through burying one partner and getting immediately involved with somebody else that we knew what the outcome was going to be. Um, and David had a few other problems. He was, he was a, um, a, a drug abuser and an alcoholic person also. He was also not comfortable with the letter. After David had passed away, I was in the closet and I was clearing out clothes so that I could give his clothes away to, to change. There in the back of the closet was my leather jacket that I had bought way, way back in Buffalo, New York. And I could still sense it and smell the leather, and it still felt good to me, and it still fit, which was a surprise. 
And um, I put that on, and it called to me. And I thought, you know what? All my life, and this was 52 years of life, I had a great family. I had great, great loves in my life. Um, I had a great job, great support system. However, there was a hole in my heart that just would not fill. And so I went to the Eagle Bar and <laughs> found a fulfillment there and a family there that resonated with me again. But there was not kink involved because I was more interested in getting my dick sucked and being a hot leather man that I was interested in the spiritual part of what I think BDSM leads us to. And it wasn't until my second master's retreat uh, where I experienced dungeon play that I walked out of that dungeon saying, you know what, there's one absolute thing that I'm certain of is that I'm not a sadist. And of course, those of you that have seen me play today, previous times know that that was definitely not true. Uh, <laughs> so even my first experience in the dungeon did not bring me to kink, but I recognized the opportunity for our fetishes to draw our hearts and our spirits into alignment. And it gives us the opportunity to be authentic and for people to be who they really are. And now my fetishes are very, very connected to my spirituality. Long answer, sorry. No, no, not at all. Tell us a bit about your mentors. Yes. My very first mentor was a gentleman um, who has since passed on, whose name is Master Dean Walrod. And Master Dean was the owner of Leather by Boots, which was the largest and, and most prominently known leather shop in Dallas-Fort Worth. And actually, he was one of the gentlemen that I, I met when I went into the Eagle Bar. Now, as I appear today as a leather man is not how I appeared when I first walked into the Eagle Bar. Um, you have to have to kind of get me from where I was to how I got to here. I was, I'm a licensed hairdresser, so I had much more hair, and it was always perfectly coiffed. I had, uh, I had a great line of colognes, very expensive and very odorous. Um, I had carrot diamond earrings in each ear, um, a number of rings and diamonds, and you know, kind of looked like the 60s hairy chest, lots of gold chain type deal. That's how I walked into the Eagle guys. And wow. I, Master Dean was one of the first people that I saw and I recognized the power that this man had over the boys, which I was looking for. Uh, I watched him operate, and I thought, ooh, that's what I want to be. I want to be that kind of leather man. And I sort of went up to Dean and, and chatted with him a little bit. He gave me a very clear indication that, I don't think so, sir. <laughs> to go off that way a little bit, I don't think you'd fit. And I did what any good leather man would do, is I stalked him. <laughs> I wanted what he had, and I, I hung around long enough where he was willing to take a chance on me. And he shared his philosophies, he shared um, his strengths and his weaknesses with me, and made me realize that authenticity was what it was about. And it wasn't about the rules about what you wear, it's not about the rules of how you play, or it was the rules about being responsible, about being honored, being loyal, having integrity, those were the things that, that would ground you to being a leather man. And he was my very, very first mentor. Um, he, and he was unofficial, my mentor. I mean, he's, he, we never really signed a contract in the mentorship, but, but he's, he's what I, what I um, aspired to be. And um, I've had, I think, one other great teacher in my leather life, and that, that gentleman, I'm not going to mention his name. Uh, on tape because he is not wishing to be known any longer because he's gone back to his spiritual practice. Um, but he's he's what I call the mad desert master. Those of many of you know who I'm talking about. And uh, I love him deeply. He is still uh, a person of my heart. And he has really wrenched down my spirituality with my leather. And uh, there's no longer any separation between that for me. What does mentoring, uh, how does, rather, how does mentoring benefit today's community? Um, well, it, it, it has, I think it plays a very, very strong role. I have, I have probably some, some uh, contrary views to how the word mentoring is thrown around. You know, we say, we say to newbies, go out and find a mentor. And so they walk in and they see somebody, much like I did with Master Dean, and say, I want you to be my mentor. And somebody else says, okay, I will. 
that's not really mentoring in my in my sense. Mentoring for me, if I contract, and I've only mentored two people in, in the entire time I've been in this, is what's the connection? What's the objective? What do you want? To, what do you? Why do you want me as a mentor? And what do you want to to get from this? And how long does it last? And it's almost like a contract of going into service, because if we agree to have me mentor you, and we agree on the objectives, and we agree that we're the right combination of people to do this, then um, it's going to have a beginning, what we're going to do throughout it, and it's going to have an end to it, and and we agree upon that. In today's leather community, I find the word mentor thrown around a whole, whole lot. People say, oh, he was my mentor, or she was my mentor. We're in relation, where in reality it was a relationship and it was probably beneficial, but to me it, it's not truly mentoring. It's, it's, it's supportive um, relationship, if you will. But for me, mentoring is a very specific concept and it has very strong power to it, but it's, it's, it's only selective and you've got to let the universe help you identify who's the mentor and why. So. Wonderful. Tell us a bit about the Butchman's Weekend Experience. What is that? Uh, the Butchman's Weekend Experience. Well, um, that Mad Desert um, master got me involved in it. It was shortly after my title year, um, and he used to uh, bring you in as a, a guest instructor. The, the weekend is set up as a, it's, it's done in a dungeon and it's done with, with intent and I'll explain that. The early parts of Witchman's experience was purely BDSM 101. It was an opportunity for this individual to bring young, hunky men into his home and to teach them how to do BDSM skills correctly. So if I wanted to learn how to be tied up or I wanted to learn how to be pierced or I wanted to learn how to use a gag or a mask, that was what the weekend entailed. And as the um, group of men grew, he had to bring other people in to instruct. And so Master Skip Chasey and Slave Master became involved with the Butchman's experience. I got tagged as come in as a um, guest instructor and that he got me, you know, and it was just like, this is wonderful. And I, I probably went to every one, I probably 14 of them, um, before this person surprisingly said, you know, it's time for me to move on. And sir, would you be willing uh, <laughs> to take on the opportunity of Butchman's? Um, so Butchman's has gone from being a BDSM 101, learn some skills with men, to being an all-encompassing spiritual connection weekend of learning how your fetishes and who you are and your authenticity as an individual, either as a dominant or submissive, can connect and come together for, for good and for strengthening of both you and the community that you live in. It's a powerful weekend and really, um, I know I'm, I'm sounding like a salesman for it, but it's, it's something where the people that have attended it, and you can talk to hundreds of them, will tell you it changes their life. Mm -hmm. And when you hear that enough times, I think you've got to begin to believe it. That is amazing. Yes. Tell us a bit about the Master's Heart Award and the Leatherman's Heart Award. What are those and what do they mean to you? Well, right now they're dust collectors in my house. <laughs> <laughs> but what that's, that's the symbol. The, um, the awards themselves were, um, I guess, a recognition and an acceptance of, that the community said, we see the work that you do and, and we honor that. And, and it's humbling to get an award like that. Um, I know that when I, when I first came into this lifestyle, I didn't, I didn't identify as a master, I identified as a sir. I tried sir, I tried daddy for a while. Oh, daddy, not a, not a good choice. <laughs> I have no daddy energy in me whatsoever. I have a lot of fatherly archetype, but I have no daddy. And um, so I don't take on, I don't do boys. Well, I do boys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't take them on in service because it would be a dis, just it would be not a correct thing for our energies to connect in that in that manner. But um, it's a recognition of my choice of being what I call a service top um, to the community. That's my resonation with 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 this community. It's what I am able to do back. Those awards are a recognition of 
I seem to be hitting the mark someplace. People are recognizing that what I give back is is of value. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Tell us a bit about uh, International Master and Slave 2004. Yes. Um, if anybody had ever told me that I was going to be a, a pursuant of a title, I would have told you you're out of your mind. It was not something I was interested in. I, was, I definitely didn't want to be the person standing up there in just a little jock. I thought, oh, that would be scary. Um, <laughs> there, was, there was no attraction to that at all. However, again, this, this desert master that, that caught my attention had brought this title back to, to um, respect in the community. There was a reason in why he, he pursued it. And I watched he and his slave um, in their year, and I was impressed with what they did. And then I learned that the title itself was a teaching title, which again resonated with that service that I wanted to provide. And so I said to my, uh, to my slave, uh, Tony, at that time, um, this is something that I think we should do. And he, as a, as a good slave boy, said, yes, sir, <laughs> whatever you wish. Um, and we were not competitive about it at all. We went, to, however, we went to every single regional contest, studied every contestant, took notes, how did they dress, and all that kind of stuff. We did that uh, in preparation a year before our title to, to be prepared. Um, we competed at International, uh, excuse me, at Southwest in 2003, took the, the Southwest Regional title, and then went to International in 2004. And for some reason, the universe said, yes, you are the people that will represent Master and Slave for 2004. And that was a wonderful year. It was, we received so much more back than what we gave. And, and I think I told you we, we spent um, considerable uh, money to do the title year. And uh, we were out of town 42 weeks out of that year doing Canada, Mexico. <coughs> any event that would have us, any place we could sneak in, we bribe somebody, we'll show up, we'll, you know, We'll clean tables. You know, can we can we come and talk about master and slavery? Um, I, I think it drew Tony and I closer together um, as a master and slave uh, couple, and it it taught me that there wasn't one specific style to master and slavery. That it has lots of flavors, which all are wonderful, and um, it was it was a wonderful, wonderful year, and it's it's never stopped. <laughs> it's never stopped. Please tell us about your leather family. My leather family, um, back in, uh, and again, this was, was prior to my um, discovery of, of Master and Slave. Um, I was doing uh, the Texas Tangare AIDS rides. Um, they, were a bicycle, they were a bicycle run. Um, they used to run from Houston to Dallas in about five and a half days. People would bicycle from that in, in the middle of summer, if you can imagine that. Mm -hmm. And I was part of the motorcycle safety crew. I, somebody from work actually signed me up to do that. And uh, I met uh, this gentleman, and again, I'll only use his first name because, again, he's, he's got a position that I can't say his last name, but Master Roy. Um, I met him, and he was the cycle crew captain. And we, he brought us back to his home to have dinner, and he had just gotten a boy. And I had never experienced the dominant submissive daddy boy, any of you. And then we walked into the house, and I saw this boy pretty much undressed, kneeling at the door waiting for his sir to come home, reverencing his boots when he walked in the door. Um, just so, so so beautifully done, so, so elegant, that I had a hard on for about six or seven hours. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept watching. I kept going, wow. Oh. And at the end of the day, I said to Roy, I said, I need one of those. <laughs> that was the first year. Subsequent years, I said, I need some of those. <laughs> My pig nature started to come out. And Roy and I have formed a, a bond of leather brotherhood that is stronger than my, my biological brother. I love him as if my mother had birthed him. My, my spiritual mother. And he had boy Patrick. I then had... Uh, come into contact with my first slave. And um, we, the symbiosis between us re resonated as a family unit, if you will. And so we decided um, to join. And we called it the Texas Leather Tribe. He runs the House of Houston. I run the House of Dallas. 
He currently has a boy and a slave. I currently have two slaves. And um, what we do, what, what our house and our our family unit is about, is about service. It's about how can we give back? How can we support the efforts of, of the community that has given us so much? And um, and we will be we will be together in this life and the next. I have no doubts at all. He is he is a wonderful individual. I love my family. Uh, there isn't anything I wouldn't do for them. And uh, that's the Texas leather truck. Forty. New people are frequently coming into the community. What advice do you have for people new to kink or the leather community or both? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually beginning to write a, a, a keynote speech, which is entitled, uh, Get the Fuck Over Yourself. And that, <laughs> <laughs> that is probably the advice that I would give new people, is get the fuck over yourself. Take your ego and put it in the back and stand back and allow yourself the opportunity to learn from those that have been there before. Um, take, take everything with a grain of salt. Listen to what people say, but until you determine that they are people of heart and spirit and, and are speaking from a point of authenticity, measure that. And then after a period of time, you will find some comfort level in which you can grow in. Too many with the internet, and I'm not an internet baby. The internet has, uh, you know, gets tagged down a whole lot, but it does provide an opportunity for knowledge. And, and I send people who come to me for petitioning or the service, go to the internet, learn some stuff, read some articles, learn who your history is about, and but don't take the internet life as whole and, and complete, and get involved with the community. That's you know, and get the fuck over yourself. <laughs> Especially the dominance. <laughs> Where do you see the kink and leather communities going today? It's interesting. Um, you know, from the time, and I have not been in this community a whole long time. It's, it's been only 10 years. I say only 10, but it, it, it has gone quickly. I hope I have another 10 or 20 years to, to be involved. Um, it, it is blossoming, and it is it is coming um, alive, if you will, um, with a whole lot of, of um, energies. And I mean, who would have thought five or six years ago that we'd be able to take over a whole hotel for an event? Who would have thought that a leather archives and museum would be something that we'd be able to talk with, talk about with pride? Like that's our history and residence there. Um, so I love all of that. Um, I think, though, our community is not unlike a lot of other communities in that it has its fractioning, it has its, it has its issues that arise. Ms. Kendra um, at this event talked about, you know, we need to be kinder to each other. We need to think about things that we say and how we say them and, and that we're not hurting each other. I think, um, I think that will all, all kind of gel around it. To me, the, the, the Mandela is, is, is a sacred symbol, and it, everything that goes around comes around, and, and I think that's exactly where we're at. I think we're coming back around. I think people are looking at their traditions. I think they're looking at their histories. I think they recognize the, the strength and power of what went before and the strength and energy of that which is to come. And I'm very excited about where our community can go and as, as possible. Great. What about you is most misunderstood? Well, I think people think I'm a really mean top. <laughs> and I actually, I actually do have a, I have a, have a level of, of mildness about my topping. I mean, if you would really like just a mild scene, I can do that. I'm a little bored. Why are you? <laughs> but I'm happy to, to participate. But you know, um, that is one thing. The other thing is being a gay male, and I play in lots of pansexual space. I, it's hard for me to convince heterosexual men that I don't get any fairy dust on them that turns them into gay people if we play together. You know, it's not about that you have to suck my dick or, you know, that I'm going to fuck you in the ass or anything like that. It's about BDSM play. It's separated from our sexual gender identities. And, and, and so um, that's, I think that's also misunderstood, especially for me. I, I can sit alone in a dungeon for a whole night 
And then after the event's over, people come over and say, well, I really would have liked to play with you, but I'm so scared of you. Or I would have liked to have played with you, but I'm straight. And it's like, oh, what a, what a missed opportunity. I would have liked to have played with you also. I would have liked to have done that. Why isn't that communication and energy happening? So I think those are two, two misunderstandings. So I'm voting for all you straight men. You don't wish to mind. I'm straight men. And, uh, and I'm not as mean as, as I look. <laughs> what is your greatest personal challenge? My greatest personal challenge is procrastination. I have learned to put off till tomorrow <laughs> that which needs to be done today. Um, and, and having slaves makes that a whole lot easier. <laughs> um, and that's a challenge. That's part of my part of uh, my, my spiritual path is to recognize that right living has something to do with doing it at the time that the universe says it needs to be done versus what's on my schedule. And so I am now trying to be much more attuned to the orders that I receive, and I don't get a little voice. It's it's all spiritual type connection of when it needs to be done now. It needs to be done now. Go do it. The universe is very, very generous. It'll hit me in the head with a two by four again if I don't pay attention, but I'm trying to do that. So I'm, procrastination is probably something that I'm working on really, really hard. What will be your legacy? I hope that people say he was a good person. I hope that people will say that he gave his all. He was willing to show his heart, and he was kind. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, Master Z Dallas.